The Lord is a man of war. I mean, he swept Pharaoh's army into the sea like you would brush a locust off your shoulder. <laughs> Can you imagine? All our oppressors, for generations, swept into the sea. <laughs> and we sang, and we sang, and we sang. What was it the women sang, Mom? Oh, you know it. I know, I just I like it when you sing it. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth with words. He'd speak and things would just be. He brought order from the chaos of the sea. No rivals threatened his reign because he made everything. But Moses says that when God made us, he breathed into dust a careful craftsman replicating royal image to cover every inch of the earth. Our existence meant partnering with God in His mission to cultivate all terrain and flourish like a garden well watered, a fruitful people, friends with their God. But sin slithered in. A serpent spoke seemingly sweet deceit to Eve and Adam ate from the tree and from his loins his progeny received a spiritual seed that reeks of death. Moses says we're made in the image of God but also in the image of that first man. But God promised Eve a seed who would crush that serpent's head then. Years later, he called our father Abram from his homeland and promised him a home and a seed who would turn into a nation and bless all the families of the earth. So Abraham went from Ur, his idolatrous life and land, to a land his offspring, plenteous as stars and sand would one day possess, Canaan. Moses says, God made covenant with Abraham. I will give your offspring this land. I will be God to you and your kin. Abraham believed and he was counted righteous for that. El Shaddai visited the seedless womb of Abraham's wife and their sighs turned into laughs. Baby Isaac was born. Jehovah Jireh provided and from him came two great nations, but just one seed would possess God's promised inheritance. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, that deceiver, met God at a rock, wrestled and got his name changed from deceiver to he who strives with God. Israel, our father, birthed our twelve tribes and his twelve sons, but through one beloved, sold as slave, betrayed, abused through brotherly hate, driven away but by God made great through rejected Joseph's providential pain, Israel was saved. And there in Egypt, Jacob blessed our 12 tribes and reminded them Goshen wasn't their home. God would surely visit them and plant them in the promised land. Yet, severe oppression came next. Ruthless slavery, mortar and brick. Years of affliction was it, long enough for God to forget all that he said to Abraham? All our baby boys got caught in the crossfire of that serpent Pharaoh's guile. Nine months they swam safe in our wombs, then drowned in the mouth of the Nile. My mom's brother, my uncle, Slain before he knew a name. <laughs> 
our seeds sapped before budding root and shoot discarded. We were a threat to them. Oh, how we longed to be drawn from the bitter, bloody waters. We were drowning. Generations of slavery. And counting. But God heard. God saw he would not forget his covenant. He knew us and to Moses made himself known. In a fiery bush he told him his name, Yahweh, the one who absolutely exists. I am who I am, not just one among the so-called gods of Egypt. Then with a mighty hand, I am shut the mouths of Egypt's false gods. In nine plagues worked wonders then, the tenth spread death to all except our homes. Covered in the blood of innocent lambs, slain for our sake, their flesh and bitter herbs we ate till Yahweh passed over us. Moses said, remember this day when we were thrust from the house of slavery in a great exodus to go serve the living God who in fire and cloud went before us and by way of wilderness led us to watch that wonder of wonders. We walked through a sea on dry land, then saw our enemies drown by the strong hand of our God. Milk and honey, ready for milk and honey. We were promised land ready. Get ready, cause here we coming. Buddy led us through the wilderness, seven weeks of testing. So there we would see his able hand of blessing. Instead, we rushed to judge this God a con, wondering if he was with us or not. Then at Sinai, the mountain of God, Yahweh made covenant with us, said he saved us in love so we'd serve him with trust. So all of Israel said, amen. We'll do all that God says. So God gave them holy laws, laws that call for faith in the God of the Exodus, laws that called his loved ones to love him back. Yes, 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 we will obey. Yes, we will obey. That is until Moses delayed upon that mountain and they crafted golden calf to worship. Had it not been for Moses' intercession, God's wrath would have wrecked us. But God, Abounding in steadfast love, renewed the covenant and allowed us to build his tent where his glory again descended. Then, after many long days, God was ready. After many long days, God was ready. Sing. Sing. Ready for milk and honey, ready for milk and honey. We were promised land ready, get ready, cause here we coming. We left Sinai in an orderly march, led by the presence of our holy God. Sing to the Lord, sing to the Lord. But was his guidance in cloud and fire not enough? Miraculous manna from the sky, not enough? All of his wonders and signs, not enough? God led us straight up to the edge of Canaan, and all the way there the people kept saying, oh, for meat to eat, this man is boring. We miss Egypt, look at our misfortune. So God sent spies to scope out the promised land, but all but two came back and said, we can't, we can't, the men are too big. We can't, we can't, we'll never ever win. And the people rebelled and refused to enter in all that God promised to Abraham. Oh, we beheld the justice of our God. He swore even then, this generation will never enter in. Their children alone will know the promised land. Even Aaron and Miriam failed to honor God, and even our Moses in sin struck the rock. Even our Moses, man of God, penalized. Even our Moses, even Moses will not enter in, enter into the promised land. I was born in the wilderness about 30 years back. Now I stand at the plains of Moab by the Jordan before the promised land. Moses, our mediator, is inching close to death. Forty years of wandering in the wilderness. Forty years of God's amazing faithfulness. Forty years of sinning. Forty years of death. 
40 years of wondering if God has our back. 40 years to raise up my generation. 40 years to teach us trust in the God of our salvation. Is Yahweh worth following? The God who works wonders but let us hunger? Will he still go before us despite our parents' blunders? Even so, what grieves me most, this disturbing question, how will we keep our end of the covenant and remain in God's blessings? The seed of sin in our hearts seems the greatest threat to keeping the laws of God's covenant. The seed of sin in our hearts seems the greatest threat to loving God back, to loving God back. The seed of sin in our hearts seems our greatest threat. The land is good. Yahweh is good. But will we listen and live? Adina, hey, are you okay? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, it was, it, I, this was a dream. My, my, my love, you need to come. Moses is about to speak. Is Yahweh worth following? The seed of sin in our heart seems our greatest threat. The land is good. Yahweh is good. But will we listen and live? Friends, that was the question 3,400 years ago. And it's the question before us today. And everything hangs on how we answer it. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses directly addresses this question. And as he does, he tells us the truth, not only about the enormity of God's grace, but about the enormity of our need for God's grace. Here are the Israelites standing at the outer edge of the land of Canaan, facing a critical decision. Will they trust God and cross that Jordan River? Will they take possession of the promised land and obey God when they're in it? Moses knows this isn't going to be easy for them. He knows that they won't trust God by default, that their basic disposition is to be untrusting and unbelieving. And he knows that if they don't trust God, they're going to surrender the fullness of the privileges of living life in the land of blessing. Moses knows this in part because that's precisely what their parents did 38 years prior. In fact, the main content of Deuteronomy chapter 1 is Moses' recollection of the previous generation's failure to take possession of the promised land. This is the, the bright and breezy way the prophet <laughs> begins his final sermon series. <laughs> Not bright and breezy. Moses takes no time for flattery, no time for trifling truisms. He gets right down to it. He gets real, real fast. <laughs> he begins his recollection in chapter 1 at Mount Sinai, which Deuteronomy refers to as Horeb. And after the Israelites had spent about a year at Horeb, God commands them to turn and begin making their way to the promised land. And they come as far as Kadesh Barnea, a gateway into the promised land. But at Kadesh, the Israelites rebelled against God and refused to take possession of the promised land. So God judged that whole generation and delayed giving the gift of the land. A whole generation, with the exception of two faithful spies, forfeited the privileges of abundant life in the land of promise. Why? Because they didn't believe God's promise. Now on the plains of Moab, Moses is recounting this story to the new generation so that they will not fall by the same disobedience. And as he does, even, even though he's telling the story about their parents and their parents were the ones who rebelled against God, Moses doesn't let this new generation off the hook. He doesn't refer to the culprits at Kadesh as they or your parents. He simply refers to them as you. That's because the new generation's heart condition is exactly the same as their parents. It's a chronic condition, that seed of sin in our hearts. In fact, a few chapters later, Moses says to the new generation, 
you have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Not bright and breezy. This is, this is a mother calling out to her child who's about to step into oncoming traffic. We, we can feel Moses' sense of urgency. And as he preaches, Moses is concerned about two types of people. He's concerned about the unregenerate Israelite. That is, the woman who, though she's journeyed with God's people through the wilderness for many years, her eyes have seen God's mighty works, she's never personally trusted God as her covenant king. She's, she's never yielded her heart to God in saving faith. And Moses is also concerned about the regenerate Israelites, that is, the true believer whose heart will waver when she faces trial. Moses himself is a true believer who, on account of his disobedience in the wilderness, forfeited certain aspects of abundant life. Moses himself, the covenant meteor, is excluded from entering into the promised land. Now, in the New Testament gospel accounts, we see Moses alive and well at the Mount of Transfiguration. <laughs> He's inside the promised land testifying to Jesus. So we know that one day Moses will make it safely home to the new heaven and new earth. But during his ministry among the Israelites, he forfeited certain aspects, certain privileges of abundant life. And here is the dying prophet urging his younger brothers and sisters not to follow in his steps. So Moses is concerned about these two types of people, the unbeliever and the believer, and so am I. Each and every one of us must heed the warning of Kadesh. Whether that warning standing before us today is of not taking hold of God's promise of eternal life or abundant life. As the Apostle Paul tells us, the events of Israel's failure in the wilderness have been written down in this book, the Bible, for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. One final word by way of introduction, and that is that Deuteronomy chapter 1 is not the book's only warning about this danger, the danger of forfeiting, uh, the, the danger of forfeiting aspects of God's blessing through our unbelief. Please turn with me actually to your Deuteronomy field guide on page 8. There you'll notice uh, the, the basic structure of Moses' three sermons, including his first sermon which begins at chapter 1, verse 6, and stretches all the way to chapter 4, verse 40. You'll notice that Moses' first sermon has two parts to it. The first part of Moses' sermon is chapter 1 through 3, in which Moses tells important moments of Israel's relationship with God. And Moses concludes this historical review by reiterating his own exclusion, his own disqualification from entering the promised land. So the history that Moses tells in chapters one through three is framed by warnings of the danger of forfeiting God's blessing through unbelief. And actually, the whole book is framed like this. Chapter 34, the last book of Deuteronomy, the last chapter of Deuteronomy includes the narrator's recounting of how Moses dies on Mount Nebo outside the promised land, catching a glimpse of its glory, but disqualified from entering it. So the whole book is framed in this way. References to exclusion from God's full blessing occur in chapter one and in chapter 34. In other words, there's something very important for us to understand here. Something critical to the theology of the whole book about the consequences of hardening our heart to God's promise. In some sense, the whole book of Deuteronomy can be seen to be addressing this fundamental problem exemplified at Kadesh. And friends, we've got to understand this problem. And we've got to have an answer for it if we want to enjoy the full privileges of our covenant relationship with God. Let's look to the Lord now and ask that he help us do this. Father, in your mercy and by your spirit, open our eyes 
that we may see you. Speak, O Lord, for your servants listen. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 1, the first portion of Moses' first sermon on the plains of Moab. Hear the word of the Lord. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan and the wilderness and the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophil, Laban, Hazarot, and Dizahab. It is an 11 days journey from Horeb, that is Mount Sinai, by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. After the Lord had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtarot and Nedre. Beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah and the hill country and in the lowland and in the Negev and by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. At that time, I, Moses, said to you, I am not able to bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he has promised. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of tens, and officers throughout your tribes. And I charged your judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the resident alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. And the case that's too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at the time all the things that you should do. Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the, by, the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. The thing seemed good to me and I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe. And they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshcol and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt and before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents and fire by night and cloud by day to show you by what way you should go. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me, the Lord was angry on your account and said, you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones who you said would become a prey and your children who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there and to them I will give it and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn 
and journey into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Then you answered me, we have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, say to them, do not go up or fight, for I am not in your midst, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, and you would not listen, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the hill country. Then the Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do and beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord did not listen to your voice or give ear to you. So you remained at Kadesh many days, the days that you remained there. This is the word of the Lord. I'm not going to lie, I had to practice to read it that fast. <laughs> Verses 1 through 5 introduce Moses' first sermon in the whole book of Deuteronomy. These are the words that Moses spoke. And these words that Moses spoke are God's holy and inspired words. Moses speaks, verse 3, according to all that the Lord God had given him in commandment to them. And in verse 5, Moses undertook to explain this law or to expound this instruction. Moses is a biblical expositor. (laughs) He's reiterating God's law he had originally given to his people at Mount Sinai, and then Moses is applying that to the new circumstances of this new generation. So what does Moses say? He introduces his first sermon with one main idea. God gives us everything we need to trust him. And when we don't, we forfeit his blessing. God gives us everything we need to trust him, verses 6 through 21. And when we don't, we forfeit his blessing, verses 22 to 46. First, in verses 6 through 21, God has given us everything we need to trust him. Now, Now, what exactly is God calling the Israelites to trust him about? The main command appears in verse 8 and in verse 21. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land God swore to your fathers. These two exhortations hold the unit of this first unit of thought together like two bookends. Now, certainly, this is an awesome challenge to trust God and willingly face all kinds of obstacles in order to obey his command. As Moses readily acknowledges in verse 19, it is a great and terrifying wilderness filled with fearsome enemies. But notice that God doesn't issue a command and then disappear, leaving his people to fend for themselves. No, verses 6 through 21 emphasize God's manifold provision for Israel's obedience. And this shows us that Israel must take possession of God's promise by faith, by believing him and relying upon his provisions for them. Moses highlights four gifts God has provided to his people so he can trust them. Gifts that God gave to the first generation, gifts he's also given to the new generation, and gifts he's given to us as well. And friends, these are vital gifts for us to take hold of in order to trust the Lord and to know him. So let's look together at these four gifts. First, in verses six through eight, God has given them clear guidance. He's given them clear guidance. Now, perhaps those of us who are directionally challenged will more readily see just how gracious a gift this is. At Horeb, God faithfully met his people where they were and led them where they needed to go. He's the commander of their army, their their captain, and he's intimately engaged in their journey. The very God who spoke a word and the cosmos came into existence has spoken directly to them. God's commandments are precious provisions of his grace. He's given them his righteous statutes so they can live as his set-apart people in this world. We notice that his commandments are these Precious provisions of grace that are rooted in his covenant promises. For example, look with me at verse 8. 
Even the the structure of this verse, verse 8, shows the dynamic interplay of promise and command. God's command to, to go in and take possession is nestled in the evidence of God's faithfulness. God has set this land before them, the land of their inheritance that he promised long ago to Abram and to his descendants. And now God is giving them clear guidance about how to take possession. You know, sometimes we think of God's commands as burdensome. But the law of God is a delight to the one who delights in God. (laughs) Sweeter than honey. It's, It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It's because God is good that he gives the Israelites clear guidance because he wants them to prosper. Verses nine through 12 highlight a second gift God has provided for his people. Namely, God has fulfilled his promises to them. He's fulfilled his promises to them. The very reason that the people have become a burden to Moses, creating the need for him to institute further leadership structures, is that there are so many of them. This is further evidence of God's fulfillment of his promise to Abraham. Moses says in verse 10, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. Here, Moses is using exact language from the passages in Genesis where we read about God's original promise to Abram. It's it's Moses' way of highlighting God's faithfulness by quoting portions of the original promise while he's pointing at the evidence of God's fulfillment of it. He's saying, behold the evidence, Israelites, of God's utter faithfulness. He's kept his promise to multiply you and make you a great nation, and you can rest assured that he will keep his promise to fulfill, to, to give you this land. God has fulfilled his promises to them, and they can see the evidence of it. This ought to motivate them to trust him. We encounter a third gift God has provided his people to help them trust him in verses 13 through 18. And that is that God has established justice among them. He's established justice among them. Now, someone told me that justice is a hot topic these days. (laughs) Let's look to these verses and see how God's word instructs us. God's appointed prophet institutes a righteous judicial system for the tribes of Israel. This system is critical to the Israelites' unity and also to their eventual enjoyment of God's blessing in Canaan. It's also critical to their public witness (laughs) to the surrounding nations. That's because when God's people implement his righteous statutes, it makes visible God's righteousness, causing other nations to look and see something distinct about this people and their God. Look with me at verses 16 and 17 in particular. The foundation of this system is equitable judgment without partiality. So when a judge hears a case between a rich person and a poor person, he must be fair. When he hears a case between a citizen who is ethnically Hebrew and a resident alien who is not ethnically Hebrew, he must be fair. This, of course, is intended to protect vulnerable persons in particular from miscarriages of justice due to favoritism. No judge is to let himself be intimidated by anyone seeking to pervert justice because the judgment is God's. That is, human authorities among God's people must judge righteously because they're reflecting the divine judge. Now, it could be easy for those of us who have never experienced personally the pain of unjust systems to to view verses 13 through 18 as a bit of a digression, as if it doesn't really fit into Moses' flow of thought about God's essential provisions for his people. But imagine with me how these freshly redeemed slaves received this gift. Imagine how they would have rejoiced over God's institution of systems to promote equity and justice, especially with a view to protect vulnerable persons, such as the poor and ethnic minority resident aliens. 
Matters of corporate justice among God's people are not peripheral. They weren't peripheral for Old Covenant believers, and they're not peripheral for New Covenant believers. They're at the very heart of God's purposes for His holy people. And in our age of social elitism, racial injustice, economic disparity, how we must treasure this gift to the church and gladly apply it. This is part of how we show the world what God is like. God has established justice among them. This is a precious and necessary gift. Verses 19 through 21 focus on a fourth divine gift that ought to inspire God's people to trust him. That is, God has protected them. He's protected them. The Israelites obeyed God's command in verse 7 to leave Horeb and journey toward the promised land. And they came as far as Kadesh. And look how God blessed their obedience and guarded them from their enemies in the midst of great danger. They can be confident in God's ongoing care for them as they walk by faith. God's vast provision serves as the backdrop to Moses' final exhortation in verse 21. Do not fear or be dismayed. And isn't it true that God's faithfulness is always the sure foundation upon which he calls his people to stand and make a decision of faith? God's vast provision for us serves as a backdrop for his exhortations that we not fear or be dismayed in this life. He's given us everything we need to trust him. He's given us clear guidance in his son and his word and by his spirit And the Lord Jesus Christ, he's decisively fulfilled his promises to us. He's established justice among us and protected us. And so we too must take possession of God's promises by faith, by believing him and relying on his gracious provisions. But so often we don't. We struggle to trust him. Against the backdrop of God's lavish provision in our lives, so often we reject his counsel. And so did the Israelites at Kadesh. As Moses proceeds to tell the story, we see the spectacular faithfulness of God juxtaposed with the spectacular unfaithfulness of God's people. Please turn with me now to our second major section in verses 22 through 46 where we learn that when we don't trust God, we forfeit his blessing. As Moses recounts these events, he teaches the Israelites that they hardened their heart toward God in three distinct stages, skepticism, defiance, and false repentance. Skepticism, defiance, and false repentance. These are the three distinct stages in which the Israelites hardened their heart toward God. And these three stages show us different sorts of defense mechanisms that we use to avoid having to trust God. Before unbelief blossoms into full-fledged defiance, it so often begins in skepticism, doesn't it? We recall how Satan said to Eve, did God really say? When God calls us to trust him about something that feels risky, it triggers all of our instincts to play it safe. Instinctively, we want to rely on what we perceive to be our own strength, our own resources. So we crunch the numbers and we take inventory of our resources. And if we deem that God's command is reasonable and that the level of trust required to obey it is manageable, then we'll obey him. We forget that God doesn't call his people despite their weakness, but because of it. I personally struggle with this very deeply. I know that many of you do as well. Our skepticism towards God's promise so often comes out of this sort of unbelief, this impulse to rely on ourselves. And in verses 22 through 25, this is the case with the Israelites. Rather than simply taking God at his word, they investigate the situation, and God humbly allows their scrutiny. In my view, that's the best way to interpret the sending out of the 12 spies. 
Now, the book of Numbers also gives an account of these same events. And the account in Deuteronomy and the account in Numbers have different emphases. They emphasize different things. But I think there's a simple way to reconcile this. That is, that the idea to send the spies originated with the people, as in the Deuteronomy account. Moses then hears their request and takes it to the Lord and inquires about it. God grants their request and commands Moses to implement it. This final part of the process, God commanding Moses to implement it, is the part that we see in the book of Numbers. But the idea to send the spies originates with the people. They'll send spies to do some reconnaissance work and then they'll think about whether or not to trust God's promise. They're calculating. They're sizing up their opponents to see if they can handle them in their own strength and with their own resources. And in verse 25, the spies bring back fruit from the promised land that shows the land's abundance. They say, it is a good land that our God is giving us. It's all just as God has said. So now, a critical moment of decision. After we've investigated and what we find confirms God's faithfulness, will we go forward in faith? Sadly, the Israelites followed the advice of the ten skeptical spies rather than the advice of the two faithful spies. In verses 26 through 33, we see the bud of skepticism blossom into full-fledged defiance. And this is the second stage of the Israelites hardening their heart toward God. Moses sums it all up in verse 26, yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. Then he elaborates on their rebellion, and you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven, and besides, we've seen the sons of the Anakim there. The people of Israel are standing outside the promised land (laughs) to which God has safely brought them and which God has set before them as a gift, and they're complaining. They're accusing God of having genocidal intentions. Why? How is such a thing possible? Our brothers have made our hearts melt. Fear They're terrified of the big, bad enemies and the towering cities. Their imaginations are more captivated by the greatness of their enemies than by the greatness of God's provision. This is what fear does. Fear leads us to view our obstacles as insurmountable. It leads us to despair. And in our despair, we start to resent God. We we believe lies about him. We think he's against us, that he's trying to destroy us. What an accusation. This this couldn't have contradicted the truth more starkly. The Israelites project their fear onto God and make him out to be like Pharaoh. And in one moment, they disregard generations of relational history in which God has proven his steadfast love to them. Because all they can see in their mind's eye are the Anakim, those mighty giant warriors in the land of Canaan. We too have many obstacles in our mind's eye. We've gathered here from various places all over the world and we've brought heavy burdens with us. These burdens are real and they're towering. We see a nation in crisis a culture that scorns the biblical gospel as shameful and bigoted. We see broken political and judicial systems, broken cities, broken homes, broken lives. And in our churches, we see religious leaders who abuse the very people they're called to protect. We see fracture and division among God's people. We see whole denominations abandoning the gospel. And in our personal lives, we see cancer. We see a husband's rejection. We see an empty chair at our dinner table where our loved one used to sit. We see weakness, besetting sin, crippling shame. We see death. We see the devil himself 
like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Truly, our foes are greater and taller than we. Our troubles are great and highly fortified. We are no match for them. So what hope is there for us? Must we despair? Must we shut our eyes to the power of our foes and just adopt blind faith? The example of Caleb and Joshua answer a resounding no to these questions. Caleb and Joshua saw the Anakim, just like the other ten spies. They saw the towering cities, but they saw more than that. They saw something else, something that relativized those mighty Anakim. In the Numbers account, Caleb said to the people, the Lord is with us, do not fear them. This is precisely Moses' logic in verses 30 through 33. God graciously sends his prophet to appeal to his people even in the midst of their hateful accusations of him. And Moses pleads with them to see the whole picture. He's reminding them of what they've seen of their mighty redeemer. Now this isn't the first time that Moses has emphasized what the people see. In verses 8 and 21, for example, God's people are instructed to see the good land that God has set before them. And in verse 10, they're called to behold how God has faithfully multiplied them. And in verse 19, they're reminded of the terrifying wilderness they saw in which God protected them. In verse 25, they see the good fruit of the land. And here in verses 30 through 33, Moses is pleading with them to see God in their midst, to behold him, to to remember the signs of his saving presence that they've witnessed with their own eyes. He reminds them that the Lord is their strong deliverer. They're their mighty warrior who goes with them in the fight and they've seen it. They've seen his power to defeat their enemies. But he's not only powerful, he's tender. He's their tender, gentle father who carries them. He doesn't just walk with them, he carries them. And they've seen it. And he's their great pioneer, their their ever-present guide. He led them out of Egypt, showing them the evidence of his presence and fire by night and in a cloud by day. He even went ahead of them to explore the land. They didn't need to send spies. And he's brought them safely to the doorway of the promised land, their inheritance. God is their mighty warrior, their their tender father, their vigilant pioneer. He is the ultimate provision of grace on whom they must rely. He is the great gift His very presence among this rebel-hearted people is the ultimate reason they can trust him. They've rebelled against God time and time again. They've accused him of trying to murder them. And yet there he was in the fray at Kadesh, still offering to fight for them, still offering to guide them, still, still meeting their needs. Ladies, look at his long suffering. Look at his mercy. Do you see him? Do you see our God who's so committed to fulfilling his promises to us, so committed to dwell in our midst, that while we were still enemies with him, he sent his son into the fray of rebels to rescue us? Jesus endured hateful accusations in the fray. He was condemned a criminal by the very ones he came to save. He was hanged on a tree bearing the curse of God in order to rescue us from it. He was murdered. At Calvary, we see God's faithfulness and our unfaithfulness come to sharpest expression. The supremely faithful, ever-trusting Son of God crucified by rebels for rebels. Friends, look at the cross and see what it takes to solve our great problem of Kadesh. Our mighty warrior dying a rebel's death in our place as our substitute so that whosoever would believe in him would have life and have it to the full. But the bonds of death couldn't hold Jesus. He rose victorious from that grave. 
Death is swallowed up in victory. And because of his faithful, humble obedience to his father, even unto death on a cross, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ladies, every foe that comes against God's people will one day bow the knee before this mighty warrior. He is Lord. Do you see him? Will you look beyond your afflictions and your disappointments to see him in his resplendent glory, seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for you? He's gone there before us to prepare a place for us. He's our great pioneer who will return and bring us safely to our homeland. No one else can do this for us. Moses finishes his ministry preaching to God's people, pleading with them to trust the Lord, but he can't take them into the promised land. And Dr. King said he couldn't take his followers there. All he could say was, I've seen it. But Jesus can do for us what Moses never could. In this regard, the greater Moses, the Lord Jesus Christ, is unlike the first, and he's the greater of the kings. He's the greater Joshua who will lead us into the promised land, lead us to our homeland, the new heavens and new earth where we shall see face to face. So when Canaan, when when cancer is staring us down, when we're eyeball to eyeball with our most shameful addiction, when we see injustice all around us, we do not fear and we are not dismayed for the Lord is in our midst. We go forward in faith. The saving presence of our mighty champion in our midst relativizes the power of even our deadliest foes. We are no match for them, but they are no match for him. This is what faith does. It enables us to see who's really there. Because what our heart believes, our eyes see. And what we see determines how we listen. This is why Moses deals with the problem of Kadesh before he calls the new generation to listen and live in chapter 4. And before he unpacks the content of God's law in chapter 5. He wants them to be sobered to their utter need for God and to cry out to him, we believe, help us in our unbelief. And ladies, this is how we must deal with our wavering hearts when we face trials and temptations. We draw near to him. We trust him to conquer even the foe of our lingering unbelief. The rest of the story at Kadesh warns us about what happens when instead we keep hardening our heart to God. The Israelites at Kadesh didn't look to the Lord for help. They didn't approach Moses to ask him to intercede for them. They didn't cry out to God for mercy. No, they they hardened their heart. And so in verses 34 through 40, God declares that they will not see the good land he swore to give their fathers. Only Caleb and Joshua will see it. So rather than the Israelites bringing their journey to its intended culmination, they turn back into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea ultimately. A tragic reversal of the Exodus journey. This is terribly anticlimactic. But we must notice here how God's discipline is yet another provision of his grace. His judgment here plays a part in his eventual provision for the nation. Ultimately, God doesn't go back on his promise. He doesn't abandon his people. He tells them that he'll keep his promise through their children. And not only does God stay committed to his promise, but he disciplines the nation of Israel for their own good in order to fulfill that promise. A few chapters later, Moses explains to the new generation that God led them through the wilderness to hunger, to, to humble them. He let them hunger so that they would learn to live by every word that comes from God's mouth. God trains them in this way so that when their time comes, they'll listen and live. 
and thereby experience the fullness of God's blessing. So his very discipline here is his way of keeping his promise to the people. It's part of his solution to the problem of Kadesh, patiently teaching his children to trust them. But no one likes to be disciplined, especially when it exposes our need for it, when it exposes our spiritual or moral failure. In fact, it's probably true that most of us struggle most to trust God in the wake of our failure. When we see painful consequences of our sin, it's so tempting to resist humbling ourselves before God and accepting his fatherly discipline. Instead, we tend to to focus all our energy on figuring out how we can come out of the situation unscathed with as few consequences as possible. Perhaps we notice some troubling effects of a certain sin pattern in our life. And so we say, okay, this is bad, but I can fix it. Or else in our shame, we say, this is all my fault, so I must fix it. So we look for other ways, self-reliant ways, of remedying our problem apart from accepting God's remedy. It's just too humbling. And this is part of the problem of Kadesh. That in our unbelief, we resist submitting to God, and so we reject his gracious solution to our problem. We try to solve our problem our way, but there's only one way, and that's God's way. And it requires that we humble ourselves to receive his blessing as a gift, not anything we can secure on our own. The Israelites at Kadesh refused to humble themselves. After they heard the consequences of their unbelief, they didn't repent and recommit themselves to trust the Lord. They didn't ask Moses to intercede for them. They further hardened their heart in false repentance, as we see in verses 41 through 46. And this is the third and final stage of their hardening their heart to God. They tried to dress up their rebellion as if it were obedience. Look with me at verse 41. We have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. They presumptuously tried to retrieve that forfeited blessing in their own strength. All while ignoring God's voice and marginalizing, devaluing his presence. They didn't want to wait for God to give the promised land as a gift. They wanted to get it themselves. So they strapped on their armor and went up into the land and tried to take it. And their enemies beat them down. Sometimes when we won't have God's way, he lets us have ours. And it's terrible. Certainly verse 45 is one of the most depressing verses of the whole Bible. The Lord did not listen to your voice or give ear to you. When God's people persistently refuse to hear his voice, he refuses to hear theirs. What God graciously shows us here is that if we never ever humble ourselves to trust him, And if we never ever accept his discipline, we'll not only forfeit the land, we'll forfeit him. And this is the greatest tragedy of all, forfeiting God, his voice, his listening ear. This is the loss beyond all losses, the ultimate anti-climax. We shouldn't move too quickly from this picture because Moses has taken us here on purpose, right at the start. He wants us to taste unbelief's destruction, but not merely so that we'll avoid the tragedies of spiritual death and hell, but so that we'll embrace the pleasures of spiritual life. Because Deuteronomy 1 is a warning that leads to an invitation. An invitation from the living God to turn from our unbelief and trust him. The new generation on the plains of Moab not only has a long legacy of failure, but God knows that they have a host of failures ahead of them. 
And yet throughout this book, we hear the prophet say in so many words, see, I've set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. In Deuteronomy, God offers his free gift of grace to rebel-hearted failures. Friends, no matter your weakness, no matter your legacy of failure, no matter your wavering heart, a fresh offer of life stands before you right now, today. This life God offers you has come at great personal cost to him. It's precious. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, today, the living God is offering you eternal life in his son. If you'll only humble yourself and trust him, and if you have trusted the Lord Jesus before for salvation, today the living God is offering you the full experience of abundant life in his son. If you'll only humble yourself and trust him. Will you trust him? God has given us every reason to trust him. May we listen and live. Please pray with me. Father, we look to you for help. May you help us strive to enter your rest. Father, would you show us in fresh ways your glorious faithfulness that we might stand and make a decision of faith. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.